<laughs> okay, so the the Facebook recording makes its own recording, and mm -hmm. I just because I tell people I'm going to be there at eight o'clock our time or noon UTC, then I like to get it started so if anybody turns up they can see it, and they're not disappointed and they're not wondering where we are. So um, this the recording I'm, I just made in Zoom. I just started in Zoom. Uh, mm -hmm is just a recording for, I can put that up to YouTube. So um, anyway, I'm Van Stevens in Penang, Malaysia. And this is Michelle Wang, or Minnie, she likes to be called, in uh, China. And uh, let's see, where in China, remind me. Uh, it's um, in the north of Nanjing. Oh, Nanjing, of course, Nanjing, the north, yeah. Nanjing, where the bus station is. <laughs> right. I, I, I've been to Nanjing. I, I was there when the bus station was in the middle of town. They moved the bus station out of town. And then mm -hmm. and that, I remember it was in the north. So are you far yeah. from the bus station? Um, about 150 kilometers. Whoa. You're way, you're way up to the north. Yeah north yeah. of Nanjing. Uh, okay. This is a small town uh -huh. surrounded by uh, three lakes. Oh, sounds nice. <laughs> yeah, so that's why we always go fishing. Oh, ah, okay. <laughs> My husband's favorite thing on weekends. <laughs> it's nice to live in small towns. Yeah. <laughs> How is COVID there? Are you, is it, is it a problem? Mm. I think everything is normal right now. Mm, okay. People don't wear masks. I think um, only when they when they go to hospital or uh, on the, the traffic. Um, my daughter take a take a uh, express um, railway, high speed railway, mm -hmm. from Beijing to Nanjing about three hundred. Three hours, uh, okay, three and uh, three hours and 30 minutes. Oh, wow. From Beijing to Nanjing, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. You know, I used to visit China. I can't remember when I first went, maybe back in the 70s, the 1970s. Uh-huh. We went to Hong Kong and you had to book a tour and it would take you over to uh, uh, Guangzhou. Uh, is it uh, Canton? They used to call it Canton. Okay, big cities. Yeah, they just, just across, no, just on the other side, not Xinjiang, but uh, I think oh. it's called Guangzhou. What's okay. the name? Guangzhou. Guangzhou, Guangzhou. Yeah. Okay, Guangzhou. That's right. Okay. Back then, they called it Canton. And so we got on a train in Hong Kong and we went under organization to Guangzhou. And mm -hmm. Then they let us, they, they took us everywhere. And they took us in a bus to a factory outside of town. And on the road, For it said. Sightseeing? See around, of, right? Mostly sightseeing. <clears throat> this one uh -huh. was to a factory that made air conditioners. Okay. And on the way, we saw a sign on the road that said, no foreigners pass this point. What? <laughs> That's what it used to say. And we went to an air, the, the factory. And of course, in everywhere we visited in China, they invited us for tea. They always poured tea. And then they, we wait there and we drink tea. And it was hot, really hot. This is in the summer. Oh, time. yeah. <laughs> it's a very hot. It depends hot on the season. Oh, but if you visit the south of China, yeah, yeah, it's very hot, the, the climate. Yeah. It's like that. They always yeah. spring and summer. like. Yeah. But I yeah. couldn't imagine they made air conditioners. They didn't use air conditioners. They had no air conditioners. Uh, oh. where, where everyone was sweating. and just, but, Oh, in the 70s, right? Oh, okay. In the 1970s. Yeah. You're right. But that was my first <laughs> oh. visit to China. We couldn't really get out. But then I think the next visit, I don't remember. I think I went to... Uh, Kashgar in Xinjiang province from Pakistan and oh. we had to buy foreign currency units and exchange them but 
the foreign currency units were only good in uh, um, government sanctioned. Are you familiar with foreign currency units, FCU? Mm. It's a currency, yeah, okay. They used to- You, you need to, uh, to, to exchange of money, right? Yes, to exchange money. Instead of to getting money. renminbi, oh. we used to get okay. foreign currency units. Foreigners had to get foreign currency units. And we, uh, those could only be exchanged at places that the government authorized or in government shops. They had government um, they have, department uh, stores. A certain place certain for place. doing that. Yeah. And the certain places had very nice products. And so the people in China wanted to shop in those places, but they could only shop there if they could get foreign currency units. So we used uh -huh. to exchange our foreign, foreign currency units for renminbi. So we got renminbi and they got foreign currency uh -huh. units. And then we could stay anywhere we like. We could do anything we wanted with renminbi. Uh, with foreign currency units. So it's so not a bank, right? Not a bank, no, just on the street. Not a bank, okay. <laughs> but right now you can just go direct trade to the bank. Exactly, yeah, or, you can do that. Or yeah, you can no, just it's, it's, it's do that changed, when you are, so yeah, when you are. I've been there so are... many times. I've been back many times. Uh, one time I went to Inner Mongolia and I uh -huh. uh, wanted to ride uh, from Inner Mongolia back to, uh, I think I started stopped in Datong. Russia? Hmm? No, Inner Mongolia. It's the province. Oh, Mongolia. The northern. Oh, yeah. the province. Oh, Inner province. Mongolia. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's Hohat. one of our Hohat. provinces. Hohat. Yeah. yeah. So okay. anyway, yes, right. So I, uh, I wanted to go to Beijing, mm -hmm. and uh, I wanted to take a train, and they told me the seats were sold out. I said, I just want to go second class. Third class, I don't care. I just want to get on the train. Finally, they relented. They let me on the train. and um, But that was back in, in those days. It was You had to go to a foreign, uh, a foreign ticket office in order to get a ticket. You couldn't just go to any foreign, to any office. So you had to go to the foreign office. And, oh, uh, wow. As I kept going back more and more, I saw more and more progress. First of all, you didn't have to do any of that. You could take, you could get rid of Minby and take, you know, just get it at the bank. And uh, no controls over foreigners. And also the highways started getting really better because it used to be a very- Do you have- translators or interpreters for doing something for you? When I was in Hohot in Inner Mongolia, I wanted to go to Genghis Khan's birthplace. And uh -huh. I couldn't communicate with the people in the bus station. So I stood in the middle of the bus station and I started saying, does anyone here speak English? I'm trying to go to this place. And I just turned around and people gathered all around me. And I just was talking gibberish to them. And mm -hmm. I was kind of frustrated, but I was just talking in a nice, normal voice. And somebody but stepped But they don't up. understand English? They, nobody knew what I was doing, but they knew I wanted oh. something. But one person stepped out of the crowd and said, yes, I speak English. And mm -hmm. she helped me get a bus ticket to where I wanted to go and showed me to read the kanji on the bus. So... I could uh, catch the right. So she's, she's Chinese. Yeah, yeah. So okay. th there you are. So um, and I got the bus the next day and ended up in Genghis Khan's birthplace. Yeah, I was thinking about now the nineteen nineties. Yeah, it's um, there. We don't have. Uh, we didn't have a lot of uh, graduates from college. Mm -hmm. At that time, no, it just started um, for, you know, for people to try to go to college. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. It, the country moment. has progressed so much. It's amazing how much, how much progress yeah, it's right. made. Every right time now, I if you, here. Yeah. If you come here um, right now, I think you can 
it's very convenient. I think a lot of people can can talk with you. I yes, think. <laughs> people in China have always often approached me and wanted to speak English, and um, so um, you know I, I could always I could easily meet people. Uh, I mm -hmm. think one time I was. Um, when I actually went to Inner Mongolia, I wanted to go to the Great Wall. And so I was trying to find the stop. I'd ridden the train out from Beijing, and I knew there was a stop there. And we went back on the train. I couldn't find it. And I, I started, well, it should be about here. Finally, I got off the train. And then in the train station, the same thing. I found somebody who could help me. And... Oh, if you want to go to the Great Wall, yes, you're nearby. You need to go, because I came out on one rail line and I went back another. So, but I got off in this beautiful rural area, wonderful, mm -hmm. uh, wonderful, um, uh, what do they call it, shumai, or uh, um, wonderful things to eat in the morning. Um, and uh, the, the lady who helped me, helped me to buy the ticket, and she found someone who would come get me, who worked at the station, and take me to the train I wanted. So they came and got me, put me on the train, and I went to this uh, train station. I got off. I walked to the wall, and uh, then I went on the wall, and I walked along the wall. I was wearing mm -hmm. my clothes from Inner Mongolia. It was very hot. And so I walked out the wall until I, there was nobody there. I just kept walking. And eventually I decided I need to change clothes. It's hot out here, you know. So mm -hmm. I took off these clothes and I put on <laughs> cooler clothes. <laughs> and then I went back. What's the season? Is in summer or in spring? I, I, w I imagine, usually I got my breaks in the summertime, so probably it was... Summertime, just, okay. Yeah, but it was cold in Inner Mongolia, and uh, um, so... Oh, right. Yeah, so I just yeah. come from there, and I just had the wrong clothes, and I had a jacket, and I took all this off, I put it in my pack, <laughs> and I took out lighter clothes, and uh, clean clothes, <laughs> and put them on, and uh, walked back, and then I went to... Uh, look for a way to back to Beijing. Uh -huh. And I was told, oh, I went to the train station. The train station was closed. Somebody there said, well, that, that train station, it doesn't work in the afternoon. Uh, we have to use another train station. So he said, let's walk to that station. So I went with him. He's going to the station. And I went uh -huh. with him. And on the track, there's somebody who's selling beer. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, One dollar a bottle, I think, for a tall bottle. <laughs> Very cheap. Uh, and okay. so we stopped and we got some beer. And then we kept walking. It took about an hour, hour and a half maybe, to walk to the other station. And there, that station was very busy. And so we were alone on a trip? I, yeah. I, I can't remember where I started that trip, but uh, I'm... Oh, you were alone. Okay. Yeah, it's many times, many times <laughs> I've been to China. And uh, yeah, I was by myself at the time. And um, yeah, so uh, anyhow, ended up in Beijing. Um, I think that was probably back in the 90s. Okay. And about um, 40 or 50 years ago. <laughs> Let's see, we're in 1920, so probably about 1920. 30, 30, 20 or 25 years ago, maybe. 25 years ago? Yeah. Excuse me, one moment. I need to turn on a fan. Warm in here. Okay, well. okay. I'll be right back. Okay. There we go. Okay, I'm back. Mr. Han Chi is asking me for the, the address of Zoom, I think. Yeah, 
uh, if he goes to uh, learningtogether.pbworks.com, he can find it. Oh my goodness, there's let me, oh, Chi is there. Hang on a minute, I'll, I'll let him in. I just see some people here waiting. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I hadn't noticed. I we was about to, to and share. Oh need, yeah, okay. I need to turn off the waiting room. I'm so <laughs> sorry, all these people. Uh, let me turn off my waiting room. It's, it's not needed really. Uh, Let's see. In the, okay, I, I've disabled the waiting room. Okay, I'm very sorry. I actually meant to do that. You know, uh, they're 20, kind of, 23 minutes late. <laughs> well, they may have been there. I don't really know. I'm really sorry. I just wasn't. We were talking, and I <laughs> yes, exactly, Vance. We have been there for some time, listening to your story on Facebook, but staying in the waiting room. Hello. I'm so sorry. Thank you, Ayat. Nice to see you. Hi. Hi, Ayat. Ayat well. I met her in yep. uh, in uh, Dubai, I guess. Yeah, right. Yep. Yes, Tisal Arabia. When it was Tisal Arabia, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> is it, isn't it still Tisal Arabia? Is they, they no, brought it back I think they it? changed the name. But I heard they changed the name. I'm not sure if it's back. But I think they got it back. I think they they're still there. I really? I think yeah. I don't know. I, I I've left the UAE, so she's. Uh, Ayat yes, is from Egypt. <laughs> yes. Hi, Minnie. Yeah. Hi, yeah, yeah. Nice to Hi. meet you. You too. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm really Hannah sorry about here. the waiting room. I meant to. Uh, I only need the waiting room uh, bef to keep so that people don't come in before the meeting. But, mm -hmm. uh, hi, Hannah. Uh, Hannah. Hanna. Hi, in text chat. But Hannah, you can unmute yourself if you want. It's open mic. You welcome. Yeah. Do you get uh, hello, hello, hi. everyone. <laughs> Yeah, Hello, these, Hannah. These are small, Hi. small meetings. Uh, it's not necessary really to mute. So, yeah. Anyway, anybody can use the microphone. So, how is everybody doing? Hana is also yeah. in Egypt. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Hi, Mr. Chi. Yeah. Hi. Chi is from Texas. Uh, I've known him for a long time on Webheads, and uh, uh, I met him in Bel Air. He lives in Bel Air, Texas, so I, I met him because he was in Webheads, and uh, I lived in Houston, and my parents mm -hmm. did, and so I met him, uh, we met in some place in Houston, and uh, anyhow, nice to see you, and I've also met Hannah, in the TESOL conference, I think it was Chicago, just a few years ago, a couple of years ago. Yeah, was that like 2019 or 18? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. it, the one in Georgia. Atlanta. Atlanta. Yeah. yeah that's the last one I went to because we couldn't go to the one in Denver. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was right after COVID-19. Yeah. So anyway... Okay, Good. how's your conference planning coming? That's Hannah. Yeah. Uh, oh, you're asking. <laughs> That's you, Hannah. Because sorry, guys. The I'm trying planning. to focus. Because yeah, the, we've just finished one yesterday at my side, so and she's That's planning right. for another one. That's why she got confused, maybe. Ah, <laughs> yeah, I, saw, yeah, I just thought you were thinking of Ayats because mm -hmm. it was, I saw the notices. I saw the the. The, yeah. uh, the shared, the posts, um, yeah. yeah, the shared, and, and also flyers and yeah, yeah. and the, the Facebook live feed. I mean, That's I, I just uh, looked at the number of those uh, because like they so happen to coincide with online classes that I sort of give. So yeah, for example, the moment Graham Stanley started the session, I had to leave and go to finish a class and it was uh, later on that I had a look at his. Luckily, so we tried I to do it uh, uh, on the weekend, but it seems people, some people still work on Saturday, right? Yeah, look at how things are. I mean, people like teachers, they prefer yeah. to uh, go to class, training classes during weekends, you see? Yeah. Why? <laughs> because they are required to show up at school, uh, I mean, or have a schedule, you know, uh, remote learning teaching, or they have to show up at school. Yeah. 
you've heard about that, uh, Vance. It's uh, the idea of teachers going to school and giving virtual classes. Both of my students are teaching. In fact, actually, one of them is doing hybrid learning, which means that he's supposed to meet students in class and also teach students who are not in class. Are you doing that? Uh, some people are just haven't started that yet because they don't know how. Mm -hmm. But what uh, teachers are required to, to do is go to school and uh, sit at their offices, open cameras, and address the learners at home, mm -hmm. give them virtual classes, mm. which is a little bit ridiculous. My, my son, uh, I've got two of them so they can remain anonymous, uh, tells me that he has to go to school also. And then his director, uh, who is not, his director wants him to come to meetings. And they're all teaching online. And when they go to meetings, they don't wear masks. So, um, so anyway, uh, you know, they're, they're thinking, they're saying to him, we're teaching online. Why don't we have meetings, uh, online meetings, you know? really i mean paradoxical yeah um, but i mean if you say no you're out of the system so everyone is just like complying with the rules mm -hmm. if there's too many no's then you won't have any teachers well you got a point <laughs> you got a point here this is chi right correct correct hi uh this is hene from egypt uh, Hanan, how are you? Uh, I'm fine, thank you. A, a pleasure to uh, get to know you. I've um, listened in uh, for the past like funny NARS that uh, Vance has been conducting and I've heard several of your, I mean, your contributions, but that was later. I couldn't make it live, so I looked at the recordings. Right, well, uh, as you know, I, I speak very little and act very little and I try to do as little as I can. So needless to say, the school districts are not too pleased with that. Well, but and I can understand. We, we, we've been doing, like Vance was saying, we've been doing e-learning, distance learning for the last 20, 25 years. And we learned a lot you know, from the process that we've gone through. But to get others to adopt and buy in on the concept is very difficult. True. You're They're so used to the traditional ways of teaching and talking. Uh, at our school district, we have what is called the Title 14 uh, requirements, which I think started when I, I last taught between 2002 to 2006. And during that period of time, there was the Title 14 requirement whereby teachers were required to learn how to use the computers. But if you introduce something new to teachers, regardless, they will rebel just like students. And in fact, we should, we should protest just like the students. <laughs> well, um, I should not really um, listen to that advice now enough <laughs> protesting in my life. I mean, I've done some protesting that would just be enough for a lifetime. And I'm now yeah. a big pacifier, okay? I'm, I'm trying, okay? I can't help it, but no more protesting, you see? Well, I hear you. I understand. <laughs> um, enough, back enough in trouble. the old days, you know, besides teaching, I used to have a real estate company. And we had, this was during the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And I had 40 salesmen. And I tried to introduce to them this unusual device called the computer. And they were rebelling. Uh, they said, we're salesmen. Why do we need a computer? And as you're probably aware, in the United States, everything is hooked up together whereby properties are linked together, sales and and uh, buying and so on and so forth. So it is a problem to train new ideas to people who are rebellious against uh, technology exchange. You're right, uh, pushback we face. 
Yes, Vance. Oh, I was just, uh, Ayat would like to say something about SOFLA, uh, Synchronous Online Flipped Learning Approach. Uh, yeah, but I don't know we don't if want I to interrupt your you. conversation. No, yeah. This is open mic, though. So. You take the mic and you talk. <laughs> Yeah, I would just like bring you back to the last couple of um, of meetings that we had about Sofla when Graham was preparing for his session and you shared yours, Vance, you remember? And we had um, uh, Helen was with us as well, Lane with us, right? Mm -hmm. Do you remember? Yeah. So why I did is that I, I watched Lane's uh, session with Aya Tepfel beforehand, the, the, the online one. Mm -hmm. And then, so I got interested in the idea and then I, I read what you've done with uh, the group of uh, uh, learners, I think postgraduate students, right? You did something with them? Uh, PhD candidates. PhD, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we, we, I, I, so I, I read what you did and mm -hmm. I stole some of your ideas. So I was thinking of, at that time because I was setting up a project, an action research project with our trainee teachers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had to do some tasks. So I had to break down the tasks with them. Mm -hmm. and meet them for the first it was the first session to introduce what is action research and so on so i thought why not um use that soft law approach and actually what i was trying to experiment in it is the pre-task specifically mm -hmm. um so what i did i stole your idea of the video uh, lane said the video that we need to record the video and then you said that you called them missions rather than tasks mm -hmm. i got that idea from shelly terrell Oh, really? Yes. Mm -hmm. Ah, Shelly had the idea of missions long time ago, I remember long time now. Ago, yeah. yes. I've been calling them yeah, missions yeah. ever since. Right, right. I remember I even shared in one of them. Yes, right. You're right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, what I did is that I recorded a video and I just like uh, broke down the tasks that they would need to do before the, the session into three missions. And I mm -hmm. had uh, like a paper with the mission. So this is mission number one. You need to do this mission number three, mission number two. And, um, and then I posted the video in our um, LMS. We have a Teams group, so I posted the video there. And I sent an email telling them there is a video there that you need to uh, watch. And I also wrote down the, um, the tasks they will need to do. Mm -hmm. And I had like a form in the post that they need to take the tasks once they are done. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, I got your idea of uh, praising the first one to do the mission or to fill in the form. Mm -hmm. So the first couple of people who filled the form on the first day, actually, which was like, wow, um, I quickly posted um, uh, uh, a reply there, well done, okay. And yes, you're taking us from zero to at least like one zero step to hero. ahead. To hero, yeah, not and to hero yet, but at least one step ahead, yes, right? Where were you posting? In our, um, in our online group, okay. so we had mm -hmm. a, a Teams group where we mm -hmm. post pre and post session uh, tasks and so on. So, and then at that time I was also exploring Bitmo Bitmojis. Mm -hmm. So I created my own Bitmoji and I added it to the, um, to the email, okay, to make it a little bit informal and, and encourage them. Um, the surprise was that um, I got like 100% uh, participation for the, the form. So the tasks were watch the video, the first one, and then fill in the form and do a pre-task reading. So the, the questionnaire, the form, I got 100% before the, the session, which was like less than a week, I guess. But I thought like maybe because it's part of their training and they do need to do, uh, to fill in the form. Um, then the following week, I tried something else. I put the video of myself, but I used uh, Blabberize. You know Blabberize? That tool where you have your Blabberize. Blabberize. Blabberize, yes. Okay. So it's, uh, you, you choose like uh, an animal or your photo or anything. So I chose my Bitmoji mm -hmm. and I made it uh, say the message. So I recorded the message with my own voice. But mm -hmm. it was just my photo and uh, the mouse. Um, uh -huh. The idea was to introduce a tool for them to use with their own students as well, because they are trainee teachers. So I thought like the first time it's my own video and the second time it's again a video message, but using a different tool, animation and, and so on. So um, when I got their feedback, 
they said that they preferred, um, they loved having a, a video before mm -hmm. the session. They said that they, most of them prefer the video where I am talking myself than the, uh, the blabberized uh, thing. Mm -hmm. Though they appreciated that this can be something they use with their students. But they said they preferred uh, watching me talking to them. They said it's, it's more personalized and it's good because we've been in lockdown for a long time. So they said it was good to see you and to, to see that someone is, is talking to us. And, and they said this even like lower the effect factor somehow for, for that task that we need to do. Calling it missions uh, made a great difference for them. So they thought like, it's not a task. It's not something that we have to do. It's just a mission. And it was very encouraging for them to do it. That was also interesting. Um, another point, they said uh, the form with the tasks and uh, they take the tasks when they finish them. They said that this was very useful because it gave them a sense of progress. So once they finish watching the video, that's one mission done. So they take that. And the form, that's another one done. So they felt that it's, it's uh, manageable. They can keep track of it. And it's like a reminder. Ah, uh, yes, now I remembered. I also posted, I remember that you said you posted a reminder later on before the session, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what I did. So a couple of days before the session, I sent an email and I said, again, using the Bitmojis. So hello everyone. Thank you for those who uh, did the missions or the tasks. And, and I still, I'm still waiting for the rest of you. And I posted like a Bitmoji, anybody there? And so, so that it's like reminding them just two days left. And, and that was a good reminder for them. And it was again, they felt that it's kind of a bit informal and it's, um, so that was more motivating for them. Uh, so I really like, I like this um, idea of the pre-task. Yes, I did some of the other stages, but again, I think that the, um, the stages, the eight stages of the SOFLA depends actually on your content and, um, and on the context as well that you are um, working in. But what I liked is the pre-task because this can be done with um, anything you're doing online. And it was good for um, our teacher students to, um, to, to see an example of what they can do with their students. So this is an example of what they can do as a pre-task. Mm -hmm. um, recording the video, talking to their students, setting up the tasks, the idea of the missions, sending the reminder, and making it like less formal, I would say, uh, can be more motivating. So yes, I, I like followed most of them maybe uh, the first time, but again with the changes of uh, what I wanted to to cover with them. So yeah, I'm, this is what I wanted to share because I like got ideas from different sources, applied mm -hmm. them maybe in, in, in my own way somehow. But when I got the feedback about how it worked, how they, they saw it, it was really interesting. And many of them said that they would like to try something like this in their classes because they saw how it worked with them as teachers. So well, you that, that's, that's really the important thing. And that is the motivation of the, uh, the individual. Mm -hmm. There is another gentleman I like to refer you to. His name is Mr. Kim, and he is from South Korea. Okay. Uh, 2010, they reported in Forbes magazine that Mr. Kim was making $4 million a year being a school teacher. But needless to say, he was doing it online. Okay. Unfortunately, in 2015, he was only making $26 million teaching online. In South Korea, you may be aware of the fact that they are selling a lot of automobiles and sending a lot of products to the United States. So therefore, the urgency of learning English is very important. So following his example, I have been going back to school to learn to be a film producer and a videographer. But my big concern is I can't carry the heavy equipment because I'm over 70. And as a consequence of that, I need something light like the cell phone. So I found that the cell phone can make your videos and how you maneuver the cell phone is a really an incredible concept because now I can make 
a, a video from start to finish with concept, implementation, editing in 10 minutes. And uh, if anyone wants to learn how to do that, I can teach them. But that only takes even five minutes to show them how that can be done. But uh, yes, I think you hit upon the right concepts here. And that is the key is motivation. Once you motivate yourself, motivate your students, you have everything under control. Yes, you're right. I want to ask uh, uh, Ayat a couple of things about what she did. Sure. Uh, she's talking about, this is, uh, actually we had a webinar and uh, what she's talking about is synchronous online flipped learning approach. This is, this is a uh, paper that she, that Helene Marshall and Ilka Kostka uh, made for the Tesla EJ. And I'm an editor of this, uh, I edited this paper. And so in going over it with them so many times, I really became very impressed with this work. Uh, and this is, these are the eight steps of SOFA. And uh, I had a, I'd like to ask you, did you, um, did, this was a course that you ran in many different sessions or was it one training session? No, it was like setting up a project like mm -hmm. uh, over like four or five uh, sessions. Okay, yeah, okay. So that's, that's what SOFLA is meant for. And it's meant to uh, start with some kind of pre-work. You said your students really liked the, the pre-work. Yes. And then yeah. they do a sign-in activity and some, uh, they try to apply what they learned from the pre-work into some right. whole group application. And then yes. breakouts. Did you do breakouts with your students? Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. We did okay. breakouts about the reading that they did and sharing reflections. And the good thing about it, I think like uh, the whole group application and the breakout rooms, they do work better if the if all students do the pre-task, because mm -hmm. this is the core of it. So, because I, I got like 100% um, part, like 100% uh, of the students did the task. Mm -hmm. So they all read the articles, they all had their own ideas about them. So that made the breakout room discussions even much more better. Everyone has their own ideas about what they liked, what they, they didn't like. Mm -hmm. Then the, the wrapping up even the share out when we go out of the breakout rooms, was very, very useful. Yeah, and the, and the next steps, well, the share out, she just mentioned that, then you're supposed to start thinking about the next session. That's why I asked mm -hmm. you if you had one or many, and then give uh, instructions and do some reflection, then go into the next session, which is pre-work again. I put the link to this article in the in the chat. So th that's the uh, the things that we're, we're talking about there, these... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, these steps in synchronous online flipped learning approach. And she mentioned a, uh, a webinar that I did with the uh, PhD students in uh, Morocco, where we also had access to a forum. And I tried to engage them in the forum, but that didn't work very well because they really were focused on just the one webinar. And so when I got to the webinar, it couldn't really, I couldn't really apply the SOFLA approach. However, I could talk about it. So if you're doing just a webinar, you can get up to, uh, through break, you can do breakouts with them and you can get to share experience, but then you're not really, it's nothing to prepare for the next one. So, um, but anyway, it's, it's certainly an impressive approach. I really uh, suggest you have a look at it. If you, you know, it's, it's one, the, the thing I like about synchronous, online flipped learning approach is that it manages and uh, gives a good framework. It gives a good framework for uh, approaching, um, uh, you know, um, online, managing online courses, which I, it, and I has just reported some very nice uh, uh, feedback on that. Yeah, I think though you're saying Vance that you haven't really applied it as, uh, as the, the whole approach because you did one session, yeah. But actually, I found your your experience and what you wrote about it and all the steps you did. I found it really useful. It was Good. like I I studied it. Like it was it was very useful to see how you tried to apply and to do every stage of it. Just one concern I have about this approach, or one maybe comment, is that it's I appreciate that it's all uh, student centered. It's all dependent on the students. So the students whole group uh, activity, breakout room together, sharing out even is done by the students. 
So I think one thing that the teachers might think about is where is, if it's a class, if it's a, a training session, where is the input that I will put in, in this cycle? Okay. So I think it would come like between the share out and the, the, the stage for the following session. Because usually when it's a, a class, when it's a training session, whatever, the, the teacher has an input. They, they need to give a bit of an input before they set up the, the coming assignment. So this is where I found some of the stages of it, maybe like um, not conflicting, but like um, they are not really separate. They are not, they can be like swapped maybe somehow, especially starting the sharing out and the following ones. Yeah, let me see. If I, go ahead, Rance, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I, I just wanted to show you, just to follow up, this is a small thing right here, is that this is what she's talking about. The, I put that link in the text chat. And this is the, I guess this is the write-up you're talking about. Yep. Is that right? Uh, yeah. 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 So, and you had the document with the stages and the tasks you did and everything. Uh -huh. Okay. So yeah, that's all there. So you can read that if you're interested. Yeah, right more. So that was a nice experiment. I, I didn't really, it, it had been my first time to try um, applying this approach. And that was, uh, so, you know, I definitely uh, got into doing that. Mike, how are you doing? Didn't know which Mike sorry, you were talking I'm, about. I'm, I'm fine. Sorry. I was just about to sneeze. And just ah, oh, to sneeze. well, mute yourself quick. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Passed already. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, <laughs> managed to stop. Yeah. Okay, Chi. Sorry, I didn't didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no problem. Let me give you a two-minute overview at the school that I was teaching at from 2002 to 2006. Uh, this school was started in our district. We have four major high schools, and out of these four major high schools, they were having problems with the students, and they wanted to know how to resolve this problem. Most of the students were foreign students from uh, Liberia, from uh, uh, Africa, from uh, the Middle East, from uh, China, Japan, and so on and so forth. So these students had a difficult time assimilating into the school. So the school district decided to go to a school in Canada and find out how they were handling these issues. So then they in turn started this school called, uh, it was a gifted and talented school. At first, they stuck the students who were giving them a little bit of problems in the normal school setting, and then they took the, the, the female students who were either pregnant or really giving them issues, so they stuck them into that particular school. Eventually, over the eight-year period in which the school was, was created, uh, they found that more and more of the foreign students were being shuffled into this particular school because they had a difficult time assimilating into the regular school. But the school concept was that they would have the teachers become facilitators and the students be the ones who were uh, uh, motivated to go and seek the information themselves. The teacher would give a brief overview of what's happening and then they send the students out to go and pick up what they call packets and they bring these packets back into the classroom and while they were there amongst them, their own peer, they would search out the answers to the questions that are created in the packet. After they did that, then they resubmitted the packet back in to be evaluated, and then they took, went to another room to get the test, brought it in, took the test, and then they moved into the next packet. So this type of concept is causing the students to be more, more motivated and self-driven. Uh, self the the re end result was that out of the school, there were normally the schools would have 70% of the students going on to college. In this particular incident, 90% of the students would be going on into college. The big indicator of success would be out of that 90%, what is the success rate of the students graduating from college? And there again, the numbers are extremely high. They would say probably between 80 to 90% of the students would finish college from that point forward. Now, that being said, it is, in essence, what we would call the flip class type of learning, whereby we flip the responsibility from the teachers over to the students and let them try to be motivated and produce the information themselves. 
So that's just a brief overview. And if y'all care to take a look at the speech and debate squad that I have, I can send a picture over. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, you you're uh, welcome to post any links to the text chat that you like. Um, right. Mike, yeah, you like had a, the... yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I just like the, the idea of motivation because uh, she mentioned it and you mentioned it in a different way as well, Vance. So when, when you are motivated as a teacher, you will pass on that motivation to your students. So I could have just like done a session like any session or set up the project. But like when, when you like take the time to try and explore something new and try out with your uh, students, uh, in that case, like my trainee teachers, it, it's really worth it. Your motivation is like transmitted to them and they do the work with, they, they are motivated to do the work more. And it's also a learning experience. So for me, I had to, uh, to read more about Sofla from the, the resources that Helene uh, shared with us and read what you've done in your session and then attend uh, Graham's session because he was trying to do something with it as well and, and trying it out and what Heike said at that time. And then think of how I can do it again in my own way somehow uh, within the context I have and the content I want to, to try it. Even, even the, um, trying to, to record the video. So I tried to record it with my own phone, but then the selfie, the front camera uh, will mirror the text because I, I had to, 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 to put that paper with mission one, mission two. So I had to find a different way to do it and then maybe edit it and add mission one like as, uh, um, and on the, the bottom of the screen. Uh, then try to find a different way next time so that it's not always me recording myself talking. So it, it's also a learning experience for the teacher, trying something new and trying to do it in a different way, thinking of the motivation of the students and how they would uh, uh, react to it. Yeah, okay, what, I, what I really like about Heike's, I'm sorry, not Heike, but uh, uh, Helene's, approach is that she has thought about it so clearly uh, and included these eight steps which really need to be uh, honored and um, and she's very adamant when she talks about this I think I have some links in the in that uh, blog post we looked at she's very adamant that it has to be followed in this way you know and when you uh, and for example I breakout rooms I she she says you must have breakout rooms you know this is you agree, Ayat? Um, well, <laughs> I, I didn't really follow it like strictly the, the eight uh, steps, but I did do have like breakout rooms, uh, but maybe I changed them. So I made them instead of like uh, step four, they would be step five or maybe step six and seven, I would do them as one stage. Because at the beginning I was like thinking about oh, how can I follow the, the eight steps as they are? Because when I listened to Elaine, I thought like, yes, they should be done this way. But then after a bit of time, I thought, no, yeah, I can tweak them a little bit for the main general framework, maybe, of which course. is, yeah, the pre-task, then uh, discussion, then setting up the, the assignment and then like uh, the exit task for. So maybe four main stages. That's the art of teaching. You know, you take yeah. a good idea and you adapt it to your class and your circumstance. And if it works with your students, there you are. Yeah, and I found that the pre-task was the thing that really got all my attention and effort and everything. And that's why I wanted to explore that specific stage and how can I do it in different ways and what's, how would it affect uh, my students' engagement with the task and final production. So a pre-task can like lead to a very accurate and very uh, like, um, the best task, the best production we might uh, look for as teachers. So a pre-task before the lesson can lead to many things happening in the best way after a lesson. So yeah. well, the pillars of um, flipped learning, there are four or five pillars, I can't remember how many, but essentially they are that you take, there's an individual learning space and a group learning space. And you try to move the things that can be moved to the individual learning space and let them happen there. And then when you, so that you can use the group learning space for uh, moving up in the Bloom's mm -hmm. taxonomy to the higher order of 
things to do. So if you if you succeed in that, I think you're, uh, and, and also you're you're uh, giving your students a lot of responsibility too because they they have to, as you said, they they did the pre-learning. You found yep. that they did that. So mm -hmm. because you succeeded in making that a part of the uh, of the routine, and they saw its importance. And so that's why they complied. If they didn't think it was important, they wouldn't comply. And mm -hmm. yeah, there you are. That's very yeah. well done. I'd like Thank to you. know well, more I, about I that. I have to add, add to that as well, too, because it is when you're teaching, when I, or let, let me put it this way, when I'm teaching, I'm always trying to teach from the point of view of the student. And from their point of view, what do they see and what do they hope to accomplish? So since I'm a speech and debate coach, one of the number two things in life that you fear the most is giving a speech. The first one, obviously, is your fear of dying. But once you overcome that one and you have to give a speech, needless to say, the, the fear and the anxiety and the body uh, process causes you to freeze and so on and so forth. So for eight years when my students for eight years when the school has been in existence, they have never won a single trophy. And the reason why they haven't won is because of the fact that they're, they're for students from different parts of the world and needless to say, they don't fit in and they didn't have the acceptance that the other students had. So they couldn't perform well at speech contests. So when I was hired to, to, to be a speech coach over there, they didn't expect much from me simply because I'm an Asian. And the Asians, for the most part, are extremely shy and reticent in terms of expressing themselves. So the, the, uh, the principal that hired me said, okay, basically, just make sure the furniture stays in the room and, and also make sure that if you go to speech contests, uh, uh, take them there and don't let them get into trouble. Well, as it was, the first two tournaments, the students met their expectation. They had been losing for eight years and never won one speech tournament trophy so they said, okay. And when they went, they were not doing too well. But the third tournament that we went to, that was the one that they won one trophy. In winning that one trophy, it was enough to encourage the students to move forward. Four years later, they had 175 trophies. And one of the Nigerian students went to the national competition. And he, in turn, was number 11 out of the... 400 some odd students in student congress. And he was only number 11 simply because he's only been there that first year, whereas the others had been there two years prior. But the point here is this, in order to get them into that stage whereby they would be proficient and good at doing what they're doing, I said, well, let's take the emphasis off of the students and put the emphasis on something else. And I asked the students, and I gave them a mantra, and the mantra is, who are you? Not me, I am, and for the black students, I said, well, okay, how about you guys who are black, and you can look amongst you to tell who you are, portray yourself as Barack Obama, for example, and if you're white, then how about you portray yourself as Bill Clinton? And in doing so, if you went to contests and you lost, it wasn't your fault, it was either Barack Obama's fault or Bill Clinton's fault that you lost that contest. And that in turn instilled uh, respect for themselves, respect for their ability and respect for the speeches they needed to make. So that being said, it changed their whole attitude and their whole mindset. So well, if that's worth anything, just take it into consideration and move it forward from there. Thank you very much. Uh, it's we're at the top of the hour, and uh, I think uh, my lovely wife is getting her our dinner ready. But I, we haven't heard much from Mike. Mike, do you have any uh, anything to tell us? We can go out. Sorry, on? I was I was just kind of listening in. Um, mm -hmm. I was here a bit late. I've, I've become more and more attracted to the to the uh, the concept. I, I put in the comments that it seems to be it it becomes less like a school and more like a, a social network with a purpose. Um, and something I was thinking about, obviously within uh, private tuition is actually putting forward that concept to students. No, it's not a question of turning up for classes and following this 
this is a, a club, if you like. We have this range of activities. And you join as and when. Uh, but my, and partly this is to do with the, the kind of hybrid situation that we're necessarily, necessarily forced into. So to try and take as much advantage as possible of any face-to-face -face time and actually face-to-face, -face, whether that be online or physically, and then the offline. Um, because it's not necessarily possible to have all the people all the time. In fact, it's practically impossible to have all the people all the time. You can't have, depend on fixed locations or it, implicitly, I don't think you can rely on fixed activities at fixed times. I'm not sure if that makes it, whether it, whether it fits, but to me the software would, would fit that because there's mm -hmm. that independence given within, as it were, the communi community of learning that people can join together when it's convenient to them, when it's possible for them to some extent. Uh, are you well, Mike, you divide, you're dividing it into two categories, which we found many years ago. One is asynchronous and the other is synchronous. And the way yeah. I kind of defined it is the asynchronous is you have something available for them to go look up. In fact, uh, e-learning in the past, I, mm. I don't know if you're old enough to remember this, but when we used to read yeah. the comic books, they had what they call uh, correspondence courses. Yeah. And it was there that you would write in and get a course and they would send it to you. You fill out the form, do the homework, send it back to them. And of course, that has now developed into uh, uh, e-learning or distance learning as we know it as it is today. Sure. Well, I think one can go even further than that in that uh, there can be synchronous subgroups. I mean, that's an affordance of the technology and people are becoming more and more familiar with it. So one doesn't have to have a, the synchronous activity for, for a start, that can be online or, or physical presence. And I think we have right. to get used to that hybrid possibility, but also that the synchronous moments needn't necessarily involve all the students and the teacher. I think you're talking about MOOCs, which are basically people cluster, you know, you got thousands of people, but they tend exactly. to cluster, they form the little groups. Or yeah. also the breakout rooms in Zoom, if that's in the SOFLA approach, which... Uh, yes, but they, they can independently organize their moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's actually a strong, a strong point of MOOCs, and that is that yeah. they, uh, they're so scattered that, you know, people are, yeah. they, they start out in the MOOC, they're very confused, but then yeah. when they, if they persevere in it, they find they learn from each other, and then they yes. cluster, you know, so... Yeah. But now I think people can go beyond that. I think when some people reverse to the uh, heavily text basis of, uh, of MOOCs, and uh, now I think people are much more familiar with the idea that they can they can simply work online together. Are you are you Zoom thinking about uh, are you thinking about connectivist MOOCs or the X MOOCs, the ones that uh, set out to teach a something in an algorithmic way, or are you talking about a, a connectivist MOOC where the people uh, well. Come together yeah, okay. spontaneously. I, I, I prob I'm probably referring to more algorithmic ones, that, mm -hmm. but I think they still tend to, they're still more common. I think. They are common, yeah, I suppose. And the, the other, the, uh, the connectivist MOOCs are sort of thrown together in a much more um, bottom up fashion, but they don't really try to organize learning in the way that X MOOCs do. Mm. Yeah. That's the, you know, we could talk about that next time if we wanted. Oh, Cam is here. <laughs> uh, but I tell you, I, I think uh, I want to be um, considerate of people's time. And we've been here for an hour already, or some of us have. <laughs> and um, I think I'd like to say good night to everyone. And welcome to Cam, who's just joined us. I, I didn't realize I had the, uh, I thought I disabled the, the waiting room, but anyway. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate yeah. it. Does anybody have anything they're dying to say in the last moments of this? <laughs> Just want to thank you so much, Vance, for giving me yes. that opportunity because I want to really to share it with the place That's where right. it all started. Uh, so thank you so much for giving me that opportunity. No, it didn't start with me. It started with Helene and then with the whole flipped learning. She developed uh, this from the flipped learning uh, in her case, she was doing it in EVO, Electronic Village Online. They've been doing it for many years. 
and they've kind of developed the social out of that synchronous online flipped learning approach. But that's great that you got to try it out. I appreciate hearing Thank about you. it. Thank you. Thank you. And next week, if I manage to join you, I will be in Egypt. Ah. Oh, oh great. Like physically <laughs> in Egypt. <laughs> well, oh, okay. Good, Mike. <laughs> oh, here's China. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm going for a, oh, wonderful. a, a wedding. <laughs> so I'll be in Alexandria and then Cairo. Oh, the weather mm. is very nice now there. So you will yeah. enjoy it. Yes, mm. it's cold here in, in England. Really cold. Okay. <laughs> good. good. Thank you. Okay. okay, well, hopefully see you there. Okay, well, thank you very thank much, you. everybody. This is thank Learning you. Together, Bye -bye. episode 492. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Vince. 26th Webheads in Action online web so. uh, open mic fun in R. Mm -hmm. yeah, Enjoy your dinner. Yeah, thank <laughs> you very much for coming. One nice to see <laughs> everybody. Bye-bye. Okay, okay. 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 see that you. Was great. Please see take you care. Later. Okay, later. Bye, all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, first of all, I've got to stop the Facebook thing. Goodbye, Facebook. Live stream <laughs> stopped. And stop the recording. Uh, recording. Here we okay. Go. Uh, stop.